Is that my cue? I guess so. All right. Well, how are we doing this morning? Are we doing all right? Turn with me to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We are continuing our study. Uh, our sermon series has been titled The Authentic You. And we've been studying God and studying ourselves. And uh, we've been, I've been talking to you on, on this topic. I am mighty for several weeks now. And I guess today is part four. Who knows? This might be part 16 by the end of the summer. I don't, I don't know. We'll have to see how things go. But uh, let's read from Judges chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading at verse 25. Judges 6, 25. It says this, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, him being Gideon, Take your father's bull, your father's young bull, the second bull of, of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. Build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was an altar. There was the altar of Baal torn down. And the wooden image that was beside it was cut down, and the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the middle of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself, because his altar has been torn down. Therefore, on that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he has torn down his altar. Then all the Midianites and Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together and crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 34, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abizrites gathered behind him. Amen. If you love the word of the Lord, say amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We're continuing this study of personal purpose found through a proper understanding of God-given identity. And today, as we have the past few weeks, we're going to be looking at the life of Gideon. And, uh, you know, we've determined that only from God can we discover, uh, can we become who we really are, who we were born to be. Only in God can we find and walk in our one true purpose and calling? And only through God can we experience true destiny, absolute fulfillment, and ultimate eternity. God created us to be His. And any other reality is a perversion of your purpose. I'm going to say that one more time. God created you to be His. And any other Reality is a perversion of your purpose. So as we've been talking about becoming mighty and as we've been, we've been talking about discovering our God-given identity and fulfilling our purpose, one thing that we have determined is that we need a power at work in us and through us that's bigger than ourselves. Some of y'all can't even stay saved going through the line at Walmart. You need Jesus and you need the Holy Spirit at work in your life, right? We need, a, we need a power that's greater than ourselves at work in us for us to fulfill our calling. 
And it doesn't matter. This is what we see in the story of Gideon. It doesn't matter how weak we are when, God's, when God finds us. If, if we will believe who He says we are, and if we will live according to what He has commanded, if we will allow uh, Him to be the Lord of our lives, He will empower us by the Spirit and use us to accomplish kingdom-sized tasks in the earth. How many of you have been fighting the devil all week? Well, if you haven't, that means one of two things. Either you're on his side, or you didn't know that it was him that you were fighting. Why is the devil attacking you? Because we're talking about this subject. And identity is important. Purpose is important. Destiny is important. And the devil doesn't want you to know who you really are. He doesn't want you to discover your purpose. He doesn't want you to understand who you can become in Christ. He doesn't want you to walk in your kingdom assignment. I want to show you why this subject is such a pertinent issue and a relevant study the reality is that, is that the devil is after your identity. This week, while the whole nation was focused on Will Smith slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars, something else happened. I didn't get much media coverage, so I'll read you the headline from this past Thursday, March 31st, 2022. It reads this. Biden administration endorses transgender youth sex change operations, top surgery, hormone therapy. Now, I'm, I'm bringing this up not as a political argument or political statement or to speak for or against any political party. I'm bringing this up as a biblical issue. The article further explains the White House has released a series of documents encouraging gender reassignment surgery, hormone therapy, puberty blockers, and hormone treatments for transgender minors. These were released in conjunction with a document written by the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Population Affairs titled Gender Affirming Care in Young People in which it describes what it calls appropriate treatments for transgender adolescents. Adolescents are uh, age 10 to 19, by the way. Including top surgery to create male typical chest shape or to enhance breasts, and bottom surgery, surgery on genitals or reproductive organs, facial femin feminization, or other procedures. And again, this is for adolescents ages 10 to 19. These statements have been written, released primarily in response to a new bill that the state of Florida just passed, officially named Parental Rights in Education, which prohibits school teachers or third parties from giving classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in classrooms kindergarten through third grade. Because parents reserve the right to talk to their own children about such issues. Why do they want to talk about gender and sexual orientation at such a young age? It's to create confusion. And they're not just wanting to talk about who's gay and who's not. There's this idea of gender suggestion. And how many of you know that a child from five to whatever that is, eight or nine years old, does not have to need to reconsider whether or not they're male or female? This whole thing is an attempt to come against God-given identity. Yeah. Do y'all remember last summer, July, the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir? Do you remember this? It was on the news for releasing a song with these lyrics. We'll convert your children. Happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly, and you will barely notice it. You can, come from, uh, you can keep them from disco, warn about San Francisco, make them wear pleated pants. We don't care. We'll convert your children. We'll make them tolerant and fair. We'll convert your children. Someone's got to teach them not to hate. We're coming for them. We're coming for your children. They don't hide it anymore. 
It's, it's, it's blatant. It's out there. Unless you're hiding from it, unless you're shutting it out, do you understand the enemy is coming for our children? The devil has declared war on identity. There is an assault on identity. Why? Because identity determines destiny. Yeah. Identity determines destiny. So the enemy is trying to bring confusion. For the devil to interrupt purpose and to interrupt kingdom activity in the earth, all he has to do is to bring confusion in regard to identity. It's past time that we stand up, somebody speak up, speak over every generation, not just the children. We, how many of you know confusion? It goes from ages 5 to 85 and 90 and higher. Confusion is everywhere. We need to have somebody stand up and speak what God says. God created you to be who you are. And I don't believe God's created anybody to be a, a gender that doesn't align with their physical body. I just don't. If, if that is true, then God is a liar and his word means nothing. And it's time we rise up and stand up. I, I, I read this quote this past week, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about identity, gender assignment, any of this. It doesn't matter. This is a true statement. 2% of the passionate will defeat 98% of the indifferent 100% of the time. I don't care if you know what you think. If you're not speaking what you think, if you're not standing up for what you think, 2% can take over culture. That's what's happened. The church thinks our message is just in here. Oh, yeah, we're Christian in here, but the, the world is not in here for the most part. The world is out there. We need a church ready to stand up and preach the truth. Yeah. We can't be indifferent. It can't be indifferent. This is further proof of the validity of this subject matter that we began to look at last week in the life of Gideon. The reason that Israel was in bondage and captivity was because it as a nation had begun to worship the gods of the Canaanites. Foreign false gods. They had built altars to Baal. They had built Asherah poles and had given themselves to the worship of idols and false gods. And God, why? God orchestrated oppression, why? To bring them back to him. God orchestrated an oppression uh, not just because he's a mean God or he's a bad God. No, God God loves his people. God loves his creation. So he orchestrates oppression to bring us back to him. The reality is that, is that the United States of America is in such turmoil. We're divided politically. We're divided morally. There's rampant racism. There's rampant addiction. There's rampant murder. There's rampant hatred. There's rampant anxiety. There's rampant depression. Why? It's because though it was founded on godly principles, it has turned its back on Jehovah God and now has given itself to the worship of other gods. Oh, but we are a Christian nation in classification, but not in practice. So now we endure, just like Israel, an orchestrated oppression from God to get us to turn back to him. That's the explanation of this situation. The mindset of culture and government. That we hear these perspectives and we think, what in the world is wrong with people? Here's what it is. God has left this nation to itself to show itself what a nation will become when it turns its back on the one true God. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to wake us up. He's trying to get us to turn back to him. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from up here in heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. But America is worse off than Israel was in Gideon's day because we haven't even cried out to God yet. But God is raising up some Gideons. 
God is raising up some Gideons to lead an army of believers into the camps of the enemy who will carry the torch of the Lord in one hand and the trumpet of God in the other to declare there is but one God. He is the God Jehovah. He is the God of hope. He is the God of salvation. And Jehovah is his name. Yes. Now, here's what we learned last week. Here's what we learned. The issues of our culture, the issue of our lives, the things that we deal with that would try to hinder and keep us from living in our God-given identity and fulfilling our God-given purpose, those things are usually present because there's an issue with our worship. So God addresses uh, Gideon's issue. What was Gideon's issue? Gideon's issue was fear. And Gideon's fear was affected by, his, his fear affected his perception of himself to the point where he was convinced that he was not quali qualified. He was not capable of doing what God had called him to do. So what does God do? God addresses Gideon's issues, not by giving him a pep talk or a TED talk or a motivational speech. No, he instead comes to him with specific instructions. He says, go home to your father's house and tear down the altar that have been built to the false gods that you now worship. You don't have a confidence problem, Gideon. You have a worship problem. Your issue of fear is not a personality disorder. It is not a character flaw. Your issue is connected to your worship. Your fear is a byproduct of your worship to the God that currently sits on your altar. And Gideon, you can function in the place and in this power of mighty, of mighty warrior, this calling and this, this assignment that I put on your life. But first, you're going to have to tear down these altars built to idols. See, the worship of Baal has produced bondage and captivity, Gideon. The false god, Baal, can do nothing for you except put you in bondage and chains and rob from you, steal from you, hurt you, and kill you. That's what happens when you worship and when you serve false gods anytime and every time. So the bottom line is your issues are connected to idolatry. And God is saying the same thing to us. I'm preparing you for mighty. I've called you to be mighty. I'm calling and I'm raising up warriors. It's good. It's done. It's going to happen. But you're never going to get to mighty until you begin to look within and begin to assess the altars that have been built up in your own very heart and look at the gods that you now serve that sit on the altars of your heart. And you might be thinking to yourself right now, well, I certainly only recognize the one true God. I, I only believe in one God. But again, I'm not talking about ideology. I'm talking about in practice. Here's what God is showing us. Christianity is a monotheistic religion. Meaning that there's only one God associated with the religion of Christianity. But though Christianity is a monotheistic religion, Christians are not monotheistic, they're polytheistic. Meaning we worship many gods. Mm. Too often we're polytheistic. How so? How so? How can I be a person that worships many gods. I'm glad you asked because I want to explain this morning. And I'm going to take just a few minutes. I want to try to keep this as practical as I can. And I prayed and asked God to really open up our hearts and let us see ourselves for who we are. For us to do this, for us to understand this, there's a couple of things that we need to try to define, at least in part. And that is worship and an idol. What is worship and what is an idol? Certainly worship is what we did this morning. It's, it's prayer time. It's, it's reading God's word. It's coming to church and singing praises to God. When we come in here on Sunday morning and, and we celebrate the goodness of God and we sing to him and, and we study the word of God. Yes, that's worship. 
And I don't have to do that at church. I can do that anywhere. I can do that in my house. I can do that in my car. I can worship. I can read God's Word. I can sing His praises anywhere. But just remember this, worship is not an act. Worship is not just something you do. It's more than that. Worship is who I am 24-7. Worship is a lifestyle. Come on, help me now. I don't turn worship on and off. My life is worship to something or somebody. And I'm constantly worshiping all throughout the day whether I realize, realize it or not. I am a worshiper. I worship Thirdly, worship is serving. My worship is seen in my actions, and my actions are an indicator of who or what I am serving at a given time. You don't get, uh, you don't get time off from worship. You, you don't get to unplug and take a time out and say, oh, okay, for the next three days what I do doesn't mean anything. No, that's not how it works. No, you're worshiping wherever you are, whatever time of day it is, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, it is worship. Wherever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing 24 7 you're a worshiper yes. now a lifestyle of biblical worship is when I strive daily to live for Jehovah God and every day I live surrendered to him I surrender my life to him I give him the right to tell me how to live my life we call that lordship and I desire to obey his commandments to the best of my understanding. In spite of what my flesh wants to do, in spite of what the enemy tempts me to do, I, I, I try to obey. I do my best to obey because I love him. And Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So God is at the top place of my life, and he is the priority of my life. What he says goes because he is my God. He is seated on the throne of my heart. And the heart, again, the heart, because in the Old Testament, an altar was a mound of stones. But in the New Testament, the altar is the heart. So if I'm in, in, in true worship to Jehovah, the one true God, then he is seated on the altar of my heart. So when I biblically worship the one true God, here's, here, I like word pictures. Maybe this will kind of help you. Biblical worship is when, is when I have created, I have built an altar to my God. I, when I read my Bible, I'm putting another stone on the altar. When I pray, I'm putting, I'm adding stones to the altar. When I worship, I'm adding stones to the altar. And I build to the Lord an altar, and there creates a throne that which, in which he comes and sits down on. I have created in my biblical true worship of Almighty God, I have erected him an altar, and now he sits on the throne of that altar, which is my heart. And as he sits on the throne of my heart, from him I receive blessing and strength and help and guidance. And to him I have relinquished control. Now an idol, an idol is this. An idol is any noun. Remember grammar school? What's a noun? Person, place, or thing. An idol is any noun that takes God's place in your life. Now, when we think of idolatry, we think of someone bowing down in front of some kind of statue or, or creation, like, you know, that big Buddha that sits in the entrance of your favorite Chinese restaurant. <laughs> you think of that as idolatry. Oh, I would never bow down in front of that idol. Okay, 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 I understand that, but that's really not what idolatry is. Idolatry is when you turn to things that are not God, but you treat them as God. You turn to it or them for help or direction. You rely on it or them for help or well-being. It or they become your source and the object in which you place your trust. You give it your time. You give it your focus. You give it your conversation. You give it your money. You assign to it value. However you would treat God, now this person, place, or thing gets from you what you previously gave to God. And idolatry is a problem because the Bible clearly states in multiple places that God, if he hates anything, he hates idolatry. The very first commandment that he gives to Moses in Exodus 20, you shall have no other gods before me. 
The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself any graven carved image, any likeness, representation of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that, that's under the water. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, putting the punishment of the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. Some of you, I can see it. I can see it. You're still saying, okay, how am I idolatrous? Here's a more simple explanation. And I think this is most easily, the most easily, the most easily understood explanation for what idolatry is. Here it is, here it is. If any person, place, or thing has control over you, and that thing is not the one true God, then that thing is your God, and you, have, and you are an idolater. If any person, place, or thing has control over you, and that thing is not the one true God, then it is your God, and you are an idolater. I know that's hard. I know that's hard. But listen, come on. It's tight, but it's right, right? <laughs> How do you determine the God that currently sits on the throne of your heart? Whatever controls you is the God that's currently sitting on the throne of your heart. Whatever drives your passions is your God. Whatever dominates your thoughts and your conversation is your God. What did you talk about all this week? The priority of your bank account is a reflection of your God. Whatever takes up your time is your God. Whatever controls you is your God. And if, and if that which is controlling you is not the one true God, Jehovah, then your worship is directed towards a false God and you, in essence, are an idolater. Now, I want us to look at some present-day idols that try to gain control and dominate us in today's culture. Can we do that? Let's throw that first one up there. Possessions, possessions, cars, trucks, houses, diamonds. It really can be anything. Some, some idolatry is revealed in the pursuit of things. Got to have them. Got to have it. I've been saving for it for 10 years. Got to have it. I got to keep up with my neighbor. Got to keep up with everybody else. Oh, my goodness. Some of you wives have been oh, on your husband's back. Our car is 14 years old. We need a new car. Anything that, it can be anything. You save and you save and you save for it. Even you got to pull a little bit from your tithe money because you got to feed that, got to feed that account because I'm getting that thing. I'm getting it. Going to take me a couple more years, but I'm going to get it. That one thing, it's the most important thing to you right now. It's all you can think of. Colossians 3, 5 says this, Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and covetousness or greed, which is idolatry. If it's all you can think about and you have to have it, could it be that it has become your God? Now, there's nothing wrong with having nice things as long as your nice things don't have you. As long as your life doesn't revolve around those things. As long as you don't lose your salvation if somebody splashes mud on your wheels. <laughs> nothing wrong with possessions, again, as long as those things don't have you. Here's another one. Here's another one. Throw it up there. Fame. Fame, recognition, success, worldly status, 
success and fame can become so important to you that you'll climb over anybody. You'll climb over anything you got to climb over to get it. It can become so important to you that you'll do anything that's required. You'll forsake godly character and godly integrity. You'll go fit in with the wrong crowd just so you can get that position. You'll entertain their jokes and hang out with ungodly people just because you want that status and you want to be associated with such. Come on. Fame can become your God. Notice at the, 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 at the center of the desire for fame, there is the desire to be worshipped yourself. Isn't that really what it is? A desire to be applauded, exalted, a, a desire to be seen as better than others, to have more than others. The, the desire for such can certainly be an uh, idolatrous pursuit. Now listen, I, I have no problem with platform and access. Platform, God assigned platform and access is a good thing. Absolutely. God gives us platform so that we can have access to, to people to speak to them, to deliver the, the word of God to them, that our lives would be a witness for him. So that's okay. But remember, how many of you, how many of you know that, that so many times your idols can turn on you? Mm -hmm. God gives you abilities. He gives you talent. And it puts you in a place. And what happens? You forget God. That's what happens. That's what has happened to many a Hollywood celebrity and a world-known singer or musician. God birthed their talents in the church. God gave them them talents to use it in the church. What happened? They got a little bit of fame and they turned their back on God. And now they worship Satan every night on a platform. Listen, you can't worship but one or the other. It's either God, self, or Satan. Everything you do is either worship to God, self, or Satan. That'll help you understand what really am I doing? Who am I worshiping in this activity? Here's another one. I got to hurry here. Number three. Show that to him, please. Money. The almighty dollar. The lust for riches and wealth can take you over. Once you enjoy a little bit of money, it's hard not to want more. Because we know, hey, everything's easier with money, right? Money has its place. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of it is what the Bible says is the root of all evil. So the question is, why do you want money? Do you want it just for yourself, just, just to splurge on yourself so you never have to cook, never have to, you know, whatever, never have to do any, it just makes life easy? Or do you want it to be a blessing? Do you want it to, for kingdom activity? Do you want it for your purpose and your assignment? I have no problem with somebody having money. I'm asking God, give me, give us more money. I want money. I want to be the biggest giver in this church, but that's the reason why. I don't want just to be wealthy. I want to be a blessing. I want to use it for kingdom purpose. Nothing wrong with having money as long as it don't have you. Here's one. <laughs> oh, the power of the substances that we put in our bodies. Our bodies have cravings that can be felt, cravings that can cause pain, cravings attached to emotional satisfaction. We need nourishment, sure, but food intake can get out of control. We can begin to rely on it. It can become a coping mechanism. If it controls you, it's your God. If drugs control you, if, if heroin controls you, it's your God. If a little Debbie cake controls you, it's your God. <laughs> we'll move on. How about this one? Talk about... Lying at the feet of a graven image for hours and hours at a time and eight hours have gone by and you wasted a day because you sat in front of the 
television and worship to who knows what for hours and hours at a time. Television, what does television do? It tells you the wrong vision. Television, it tells you the wrong vision for your life. And if we're not careful, we ought to throw phone. Go ahead, show them up there just so, yeah, that, that thing too. And if we're not careful, how many of you get that thing? I don't know if Android phones do it, but iPhones do it. That shows you your screen time, how much time you spent on your phone. I get it on Sunday mornings. I don't know why, but I get it. I got it this morning. You know, like, all right. I guess that's good to know how much time I spent on my phone. That hour, that, that, that number of hours, you know, hey, it should go down every, every week, right? It's, it should. But the truth is we spend hours and hours on our phone. Phone's good. We need phones. We can check email. Email, we can, we can do banking. You know, ain't nothing wrong with a phone as long as the phone doesn't have you. As long as it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's not about these things being a part of your life. It's that them being in their proper place. It's about balance. Is God still number one? And it's not just that God gets adequate time. Does he get time first? Begin your day, not on Facebook. I've talked to you about this before, and this is a discipline for me every day. The challenge is when you get up, what's the first thing you do? Grab that phone, go to the bathroom, whatever you got, you know, grab that phone. The tendency is to click on Facebook instead of that Bible app. But I've trained myself, I make myself do it. Click on the Bible app, read some scripture before you get on there and see how many likes you got last night. <laughs> Come on, I'm just telling the truth, folks. I'm just telling you the truth. I got to hurry here. Let's throw this one up there. Sexuality has been an idol that has led countless men and women throughout the past 6,000 years turn their backs on the precepts of God. Sexuality, though created by God to be a beautiful thing, enjoy between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage, has become distorted and perverted and misconstrued in every way possible. The perversion of it is nothing new. The Asherah poles of Gideon's day were named after Asherah, the false female goddess of fertility. And they would erect these Asherah poles at the high places in the territory. And the way that they worshipped Asherah as a god is that they would perform sexual acts on that heel place. They would be orgies. There were, that's how they worshipped Asherah, the false female god. They say that those poles were hewn out of wood. Some of them were hewn to the shape of a voluptuous woman. It was the pornography of its day. And men would look at the Asherah poles. You know, this is adult church, right? They would look at the Asherah poles and pleasure themselves. Other Asherah poles were built and shaped to the form of erect male genitalia. And the women would perform sexual acts with wooden poles. Sexual perversion is nothing new, folks. But it's certainly a pertinent present, present issue in our culture. Our world is being ravaged by the God of sexuality, from pornography to adultery, prostitution, sexual abuse, sex trafficking, homosexuality. Everywhere you look in culture, sex is sex, and sexuality is worshipped. If there's ever been an idol that can cause you to forget what God has said, it's the God of sexuality. And we have people in the church today that completely reject and ignore what God has, has said concerning the proper practices of sexuality God's way. And they're going to do it 
whenever they want, however they want, no matter what God has said. If sex has more control over you than what is said in God's Word, if you're ignoring what God has said concerning sexuality and the proper place where it can be allowed according to God's way and according to God's Word, if it has become more important to you and you are now disregarding what God has said about it, now sex has become your God and Jehovah is not. One last one. And before they throw it up there, I'll tell you what it is, but don't put the image up there yet. The, the last one I want to mention is this, and, the, and this is the one that gets us. You ready? The last, one of the last, of course this is not an exhaustive list, but one of the things, one of the gods, if none of those other ones, el none of the other else, y'all know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> If none of the others get you, then this one will. Here it is. It's self. The God of self. When I was thinking about this one, God showed me a vision of me building an altar. And after I was building the altar, I climbed up on it and sat down on it myself. And at the same time, as I sat on the altar, I had built... I also, also saw myself kneeling at the base of the altar, worshiping myself as I sat upon the altar that I had built. We have a depiction of it. Yeah, sh show them, show them. A selfie. And I heard the Lord say, be careful that you don't worship yourself, your own talents, your own abilities, your own achievements. God said, if you build that altar, I'll tear that one down myself. First Timothy chapter three, Paul is talking to Timothy and he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of the power thereof, for them such people stay away. That's the problem. We got a lot of people with a form of godliness and no power. Because you can't have God's power as long as you're building to other gods altars to them to worship. You can, you, can, you can have some kind of form, some kind of another form, and, 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 and fit into a mold, and maybe do some things right, and, and maybe get it right part of the time. But listen, I'm looking for a people that have a power that work in them and through him. God is trying to raise up a people that have his power. We're never going to be a powerful church. We're never going to be a powerful, powerful individuals, men or women, as long as we have these altars that have been erected to the false gods in our lives. I want to be in control so I choose my own self to be my God. Idolatry, here, here's what it is. Idolatry is really an attempt to control the God that you serve, to pick and choose the kind of God that you want so that you can be in control of it any way that you want it. But you never end up controlling the idols of your life. They end up controlling you. Anger can be an idol. Grief can be an idol. Bitterness can be an idol. Unforgiveness can be an idol. How so? It's controlling you. I don't worship. No, but it's controlling you. It's controlling you. That's what I'm trying to get you to hear today. If it's controlling you, it's your God.
And you have taken God, Jehovah, off the altar uh, uh, that sits or the altar of your heart, that altar that you have built. And there's a throne there. You have taken Jehovah off of that throne and put another God there. And now we're dealing with the issues that are related to the gods that sits on our heart. Because if God sits on my heart, no, he doesn't let bitterness be there. If God is sitting on my heart, his spirit won't allow me to be angry over and over and just live in a constant state. He won't allow me to be controlled by anger. But let me tell you something. God never, he never takes control of the throne of your heart. He will allow you, he will allow you to pick and choose your God. But he's never going to within himself exercise his own authority, authority and say, I am your God. No, he has put that responsibility on us. He says, I'll be your God if you want to, but I'm not sharing your heart. I got power for you. I got power for you. I'm ready to bless you. I'm ready to, to join arms with you. I'm ready to come upon you and bless you. I'm ready to, I, I got a power that you can, you can have as you can go forth in my name and understand that I'm your power. I'm your power. I, I'll bless you with power. I'll give you authority as long as your heart is right, as long as you'll use it for kingdom purposes. But, but is, that's the case. I'm not going to share your heart. I'm not going to share the throne of your heart. And if you want my power, if you want my blessing, if you want me to, to, to be the God of your life you got to get rid of you got to tear down all those other altars that have been built to the false gods of our lives see what happens you notice in the story when Gideon tears down the altar what happens the next morning see when you start messing with the altars of Baal the devil shows up because he don't like you messing with his stuff. When you begin to tear down the altars, the devil shows up. When the men of the city found the altars of Baal they had been, that had been torn down, they raised their voices. Who has done such a thing? Bring out your son, Joash, that he may die. Here, here's what I was reading that this week, and I was reading it over and over, and the Spirit of the Lord told me it wasn't those men talking. It was the Spirit of Baal talking through them. Mm, yes. Uh-huh. See, 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 when you begin to tear down altars, what happens? The devil starts to show up. When you begin to tear down altars, the devil begins to speak out against you. And he can speak out against through, through your wife, through your husband, through your children, through your best friend, anybody else. Here's the thing. We got to recognize who is speaking. You got to recognize who's coming out against you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Understand that the voice of the enemy will rise against you. The enemy will come out after you to destroy you, to destroy your purpose, because your assignment is always going to come against and tear down the works of Satan. He will stop you any way that he can. But listen, let me tell you what God has been putting in me. It's, God's saying it's time to go in after some altars. God saying it's time to go in after some altars. And, as the, and this is what happened this week. This is what happened this week. As, as we've been talking about this, and I ha, as I have been examining my own heart and my own life and my own house, God, last week we had a powerful time at the end of service, and, and, and I just received a tremendous blessing, but I also received some understanding that I needed to go home and tear down some altars in my house. And so when I, as I have begun to do that, do you understand what happens naturally in the spirit? What happens? The devil. The devil tries to rise up. Come on. That that's why the devil's been fighting you all week because you understand from last week, hey, I got some altars that are existing in my living room. I got some altars coming through my television. I got some altars that have been established in my bedroom and it's time to tear them down. Well, what happens when you begin to tear down those altars, the devil shows up and begins to fight any way that he can. 
But guess what? I've determined, I've determined I'm going in after the altars. I'm going in after the altars. Come on, help me, help me. I said, I'm going in after the altars. I'm going to call it what it is. I said, I'm going to call it what it is. I told my wife, I said, Chris, if I begin to act or demonstrate in a way that is not godly, you call me out and call it what it is because the devil wants to speak through me. The devil wants to speak through her. The devil wants to speak through my children. Anything he can do to get access to my house, he's trying to tear down purpose. He's trying to distract you. He's trying to get you away from your purpose. So you call me out and I'm going to call you out. Uh Uh-uh. No, no, no. We don't talk like that in this house. No devil. No devil. I'm coming after that altar right now. No devil. No devil. That's devilish activity right there. No, we don't listen to that because that's devil worship. That's devil music. No, no, no. Turn that channel. We don't watch that. That's devil worship right there. I'm calling it what it is. I'm going into some altars. Some of you right now know the altars that are in your very house, in your car, that have been erected to false gods, and God is challenging some of you right now. It's time to tear down the altars. It's time to tear down the altars. And listen, can I just tell you what's going to happen? The devil is going to fight you. Get a clue. It's going to happen. I have just accepted the fact that I am going to be under attack because I'm in an army that's fighting against everything the devil wants to do in my life, in this church, in the world through which I live today. I'm in an army that's fighting against him. I'm standing on the front lines. I should be under, I should be under, I should be uh, uh, aware of the fact that his fiery darts are coming after me. I've been under attack all week. Well, good. Maybe you're doing something for the kingdom of God. Now, we don't fear the devil. We don't fear the devil. We don't fear him. There's nothing to be afraid of. We have been given power and authority in Jesus' name. I say we don't fear them. Get right with God. Then you don't have to fear them. Then they don't have access. Then they don't control you anymore. Get your heart right with God. Repent. Don't go casting out devils while you got someone living on the inside of you because they might go out of that person and come into you. Come on now. Help me. Get your heart right. Get your heart right and declare authority in Jesus' name and run out those devils. Run out those devils. Run out those devils. Listen, here's what I'm determined to do. I'm casting out everything that is not like God. Anything that is not like God, I'm casting it out. I'm casting out. We say, is there a spirit in everything? No, no, not a spirit in everything, but a lot of things. There is spirit backed. Profanity has a spirit behind it. Oh, I just slipped. No, you got a God, you got a devil God sitting on an altar in your heart. If it wasn't in you, it wouldn't come out of you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm just going to sneak over here and go look at some pornography. No, 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 no. You're not having a bad day. You're just not being tipped to know. What's what's the problem? The real issue is that there's a God of perversion that's sitting on an altar. I'm I'm looking for somebody to help me today because this is is a monumental day for some people right here because your life can change today if you understand this isn't just attack. This is about lordship. This is about God. This is about who's in control. I'm controlled by anxiety. I'm controlled by depression. What are you afraid of? That's backed by a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if fear controls you, it's time to go in. It's time to go in. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Cast that devil out of your mind, out of your spirit, out of your house. Get him out of the way. Cast him out. Tomorrow morning, do the same thing because they're going to try to sneak in. He's going to try to sneak in. Pornography. Those tempting thoughts. Those tempting thoughts at work. Where's my buddy at? 
Where's my buddy at at work? Oh, she just happened to be a beautiful blonde female. Where's your buddy? I just got to go speak to my buddy this morning. How's your buddy doing? How you doing? How you doing? No, that's, that's a snare being set for you by the enemy. The initial thought is put there as a snare by the enemy. Arrest it now. See what it is right now. Take care of it now so that you'll have a divorce coming in your future. I'm calling it what it is. I'm calling it what it is. Calling it what it is. We're tearing down some altars. Tearing down some. Just think about your issues. I'm trying to hurry here. Just think about your issues. What are the issues that control you? If there's an issue that controls you now, I'm talking about controls you. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. I can't stop smoking. I can't stop dipping. I can't stop chewing. Well, there's a God associated with that, that issue, that, that, that substance, that addiction. There's a God there. There's a God. He wants to control you. Listen, there should be only one God that we relinquish control to. It's Jehovah God because he wants what's good for me. He wants to bless me. All these other gods just put me in captivity and bondage. Do you see that? Some of you can't stop gossiping. If you can't stop gossiping, there's a God that's in control. What is the God that sits on the throne of your heart? Real quickly, when they came out after Gideon, they said, Joash, bring your son that we might kill him. Joash, something happened in Joash. Ah, something happened in Joash, the one who had allowed altars of Baal to be built in his own house. Maybe he built him himself. We don't know. Something happens when, when Gideon begins to stand up against the false gods. Something happens in Joash. And he says, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? That God that has put you in bondage and slavery, would you plead for him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by mourning. And if Baal is God, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. If your God is worthy of worship, let him be the one that sustains you. But God says, I'm not going to share the altar of your heart. When something happens to Gideon, something happens in his father. When Gideon has realigned his worship from Baal to Jehovah, the one true God, now his father has been converted too. Let me just ask you something. Let me ask you something. What altars, listen to me now, what altars have your fathers and grandfathers built that need to be torn down? We all had things passed down to us. What kind of altars did you, the previous generations build that were passed down to you? Racism? Bigotry? What perversions were passed down to you? It's time to break the generational patterns and tear down the altars. And here's what I love about this story. After Gideon has torn down the altars of Baal, after he built an altar unto the Lord his God, and his enemies gathered against him at Jezreel, verse 34 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. I love the fact that God is with us. I'm with you, Gideon. Remember, I'm before you. I'm beside you and I'm behind you. I love the fact that God is with him. But after, after, after he tears down the idols, no longer is God just with him. Now the spirit of God comes upon him. You got to get rid of the altars if you want the power. 
And we got it better than that because we live in the New Testament. Not only is God with us, not only does God come upon us, now since Pentecost, God lives within us. Come on, somebody. The Spirit of God at work in His people. I have the power of God in me now. I said I have the power of God at work in me now. But I never get here until I tear down the altars to all those false gods. <sighs> Jesus. Let me just tell you real quickly about the nature of our God. One part of His nature, He is you shall have no other gods before me. But another part of his nature is, and we see this in, the, in later in Judges, actually from Judges chapter 10, where God says to Israel over and over and over again, he says, I've saved you. I've delivered you time and time and time again, and yet you still have forsaken me. He says, I will deliver you no more. He said, I'll deliver you no more. Listen, he says, go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. Go read it, Judges 10. I will deliver you no more. But listen, Israel says, we have sinned. Do to us whatever you will, but please deliver us, we pray. And the scripture says, they put away the foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord. And verse 16 says this, and his soul, talking about God, his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel, and he delivered them again. God cannot deny repentance. God cannot deny. All we got to do is cut down the altars. All we got to do is surrender our lives to Him. And He will again. I don't care how many times He's done it before. The nature of God is that He will again come to your rescue. He is the God of the rescue. He is the God of power. He's the God of power. He's the God of stability. He's the God of strength. But he will not share your hearts. I want you to bow your heads with me, please. And remember, hold to the truth, speak without fear, and walk in God's boldness this week.